let's see. I'll go ahead and start then. Um, hi, I think most people here know me. I used to go to Georgia Tech. I finished my PhD in May of last year, and now I work at Wolfram. So I wanted to just give a kind of a brief overview of how the hell to use Mathematica to do the kinds of work you might be doing uh, either in your classes or in your research. Um, so this is not planned at all to be like a formal thing or like a, a fancy talk. Like I'm going to talk about some stuff and type it up in this notebook that I have open and explain things and you're free to and encouraged to jump in with any questions you might have about anything basically. And if I don't want to answer it yet, or I'm going to get to it later, I'll just tell you as much. So feel free to just jump in. So with that said, uh, let me start. So uh, kind of the basic object at hand when we're talking about Mathematica is this notebook interface, which many of you are probably familiar with through online interfaces like uh, Julia notebooks, which are popular now, but Wolfram invented this uh, Mathematica, or this notebook interface you know, about 30 years ago. So the basic idea is you have an input line where you can type, you know, whatever kinds of stuff you want, and then you can evaluate it and get an output that's all in one place. And if you wanted to say plot something, you know, you get graphics interfaces uh, all in the same place. These things are also objects that you can copy and paste. Um, you could do other things with them, but the point is it's kind of a you don't have a con and an output uh, file or anything. You just type and you get your results. So that's kind of the basic setup there. I guess I'll actually leave that open. Um, so, so I'm going to be talking mostly about language aspects. So something to take note of is that in most languages when you you know declare some new thing, you have to say you know it's an integer or it's a real number or it's a float or whatever the hell. Uh, in Mathematica, the typing, as it were, is automatic. So if I type 5, 5 is an integer. If I type 5.0, that little period indicates that this is a real number. So there's a function called head that will tell you basically the type of something. So the head of 5, because it's an integer, is an integer. The head of 5.0 is a real number. And similarly, the head of, say, 5 plus i uh, is a complex number. And the head of, say, pi is that it's a symbol because it's a symbolic object that can be calculated to kind of any amount of uh, precision. So if I wanted to get 50 digits of pi or whatever, I could do that. Or if I wanted 1,000 digits of pi, I can do that too. That's fine. So it's arbitrary precision. So, hey, Ben. Yes. Can you remind me how to do special fancy, characters? Yes. So to get uh, fancy characters in Mathematica, which is, you know, very coveted, all you have to do is press escape. You'll get this little three bar look or three dot looking thing. And then you type uh, any letter, say P, and you'll get kind of a pop up of the things here. But the default is if you just type a letter and then press escape again, it will give you the Greek version of that letter. So escape P is pi, escape A is alpha, escape capital A is capital alpha. So you can use this uh, for even like to get fancy stuff like script. What is it? Script A, for example. So you can get all sorts of fancy, you know, things here with that. And it's the same thing you would do to type in uh, a complex number like five. You can type escape pi. You can always type just capital P for pi or capital E for the Euler's number, or capital uh, I for I. But I think it's kind of ugly, so I don't like to do it. But they are equivalent, but you can check like that. So those two things are the same. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. So there are multiple types of uh, numbers, like I just explained. There are integers, reals, complex numbers, symbols. Uh, and then there are also things like images. So you can't see this because I'm just uh, opening this in Google. But if I search for kitty cat and I go to Google image search and I just get uh, this cat here, 
it looks like they are at the vet, I can also just paste that in directly. So you can just import images, but you can also just paste them in directly and start working with them in your notebook. Uh, so this is very handy when you're, you know, working with images uh, for your research or for a project or something. You can start calculating instantly on these things. So you can multiply all the brightnesses by 0.5, for example. Um, you can then multiply them by 2 to get back to the initial image. You could uh, square all the brightnesses. A um, bunch of dumb stuff like that. And if I type head of this thing, what might I get? What a, what a curious thing. It's an image. So at the low level, uh, everything you input and everything that gets output all has a head that corresponds to like a type in a normal language. It's just a little more general because it's not just for numbers, it's for any kind of object. So Sorry? You are cutting in and out a lot. Okay, there you go. Okay, I will not worry about it, I think, is what I heard. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. That's fine, that's fine. Feel free to like DM me if you can't talk for whatever reason, anybody. Um, so something that I kind of alluded to here with uh, the pie oops, in the wrong document. So I type this, I can get, you know, 50 digits or whatever. I can get as many digits as I want. And the reason for that is that pi here is saved uh, as a symbolic object. Yes, so Charles asks in the chat, his mic isn't working, but he wants to know if I'm, I can talk about image processing, uh, which I will do later, and we'll be happy to take questions on, because I use that a lot uh, over the course of my degree. Um, so back to this number thing real quick. Uh, so pi, for example, here is symbolic. So in a lot of languages, that's going to be something numeric, and so there are going to be you know, rounding errors and stuff like that. But in Mathematica, if I take the sine of pi, it's zero. And notice that it's an integer zero, it's not a real number zero. Um, if I do, for example, Euler e to the i pi, it's minus one. And again, it's an integer, uh, it's not a real number. So these things are exact quantities. It's not doing any calculation. It just says, okay, I know what sine of the exact number pi is, and I know what e to the i pi is. So it's uh, it's a system of replacement rules is the way to think of this. So if it has to do float math or whatever, it can do that, of course. So, you know, 1.2 to the e or whatever, uh, and then I can get whatever many digits I want out of it. Um, but the point is that by default, Mathematica is just rewriting terms. So when it sees sine of pi, it says, okay, I know what to replace that with. I replace that with zero. Uh, the same thing goes for sine of two pi, or et cetera. Because it knows that sine of any integer multiple of pi will be zero. So on that note, I think it's kind of worth talking about the underlying structure of things in Mathematica. So for example, I have a plus b raised to the c times d uh, over q. That's just some math expression, right? Uh, what I might be curious about is how is this represented internally? So Mathematica has a function called tree form. And if you wrap something in tree form, it will tell you all about how it's represented internally. So the way to read this is that this is a product of two things that are taken to some power. Here is the sum of a and b to the c times d times the power of q to the minus 1. So some of you may be familiar with some other systems that work like this, but at its heart, Mathematica kind of treats things with this tree leaf structure. And so that's when, for example, if it were to see sine of pi, it deletes this little branch and replaces it with zero. So it doesn't do 
calculation explicitly in that sense, it's doing a term replacement. And how yes. how did you for your input on three seventy eight? How did you uh, get it in uh, the pretty? Yeah. So usually when you are typing math notation, right, um, you wind up having to hold shift to input certain things. So like shift uh, six for power, right? And that will automatically pretty print. But if I want to pretty print it myself, the key is instead of holding shift, just press control. I believe that's true on Windows and Mac. should be on Linux as well. Um, so if you press control six instead of shift six, you get that. Uh, for divide, if instead of pressing the slash, you press control slash, you'll get that. Um, and if you want like a subscript, uh, instead of pressing shift underscore, if you just press control underscore, you get a subscript. So escape will let you put in the special characters, and then for special formatting, just try pressing control, and that will work most of the time. So... And again, that's not just like a, a formatting thing. So if I do five to this power, it does understand what that means. So it is, you know, it's pretty printing, and it actually you know, works that way. Okay, so, so, yes. Sorry, I just got here. Um, oh, hey. What is uh, what's the underscore for the, uh, the subscripting do? Uh, so that's really just for labeling. It doesn't have any uh, built-in kind of calculations. It's just you can call something A sub E, whatever. I've always had uh, trouble. Subscripting, it's always that's always done something weird. Like, well, like say for example, if, if your subscript, if your variable, if you're using that, that subscript in a different variable, is it possible? Uh, let's see. I never really use subscripts to be honest. So let's see. Let's see. B is equal to one. A sub B. I expect this will replace it. It will look kind of you. Yeah. Okay. So you do have to be careful about that. Um, I was talking up here, and I think you missed uh, that at its heart, uh, Mathematica is a term rewriting system. So, for example, sine of pi gets replaced with zero. It's a rewriting, not really calculation in the traditional sense. And so here, again, uh, according to this term rewriting idea, B has already been defined. So whenever Mathematica sees B, it goes, oh, oh, I know, that's one, and it will replace it. Um, Okay. I'm assuming that was a different conversation. Um, so, so I guess be careful with uh, with that. But yes, Tony, uh, I've had some trouble in the past uh, with subscripting. Um, it was the kind of thing where you know you have trouble with something, and so you just kind of stop doing it, and then you forget what the trouble was in the first place. So that's exactly what I'm the issue. <laughs> Okay. Well, if you if you if you ever run into it, uh, feel free to let me know. And I'll okay. okay. So, this idea of Mathematica as a uh, as a term rewriting system, you know, seems kind of archaic and weird and kind of maybe not worth talking about. But I think it's worth talking about in terms of how we define functions. So, for example, uh, if we have a function. Let's just say we want a function that takes the sine of the cosine of some input. The way you do that is like this. And there are two kind of weird things here maybe that, uh, maybe one is not so weird, maybe one's a little weird, that kind of bear explanation. So when you define a function, uh, any inputs should be given an underscore after them. And then when you define it, you should use colon equals instead of just regular equals. So let me talk about the reason for that. So right now I have f, right? It's just a function. Uh, if I give it some input at x, it will give me that. So f of you know 2.3, 2.2 or whatever gives me some output f of pi gives me some output, negative sine of 1. Yeah, that, that makes sense, I suppose. <clears throat> um, but the reason you would want to do this uh, colon equals bit is this is called set delayed instead of set. So let me see if I have a good example that comes to mind here. 
So let's say I say a is equal to 1, and then I do um, 5, let's see, this is something I should have thought about before, but, okay, there we go. Let's say a is equal to sine of b, and I should clear out b because I defined it as uh, 1 earlier. So if I do a is equal to sine of b, now whenever I type a, I'm going to get sine of b. Now if I type b equals 2, and I type a, I guess that does work. Damn. Hmm. I'm sorry, what was that thing you did to clear the variable? Ah, so you can set a variable to period, and that will clear it. Which is, yeah, it's a shorthand for that, which is probably what you Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm having a bit of a, you know, problem mentally thinking of a good example here maybe somebody here knows one but the difference between <laughs> thank you Paige um, the difference uh, the colon equals and regular equals is that colon equals will wait until f gets some input and then it will run this thing on the right. If you just do um, I think uh, again I'm having a hard time thinking of an example but the point is um, set delayed literally delays the calculation until you evaluate the thing on the left. So Right here, it is just saved that it's a rule that will take x to sine of cosine of x. So if I, again, if I type um, i over 2 or whatever, I get a result. But the point is that this 0 was not calculated until I typed this thing over here. If I just used colon equals to set this, uh, it would be defined instantly when I pressed shift enter, which is how you evaluate. Um, so this is what you want to use for functions because typically when you define a function you want it to calculate the value once it gets an input not just uh, when you define the function oops didn't open that okay so there's uh, another thing about replacement rules See, this is not uh, you know the most interesting thing necessarily but I'll kind of introduce lists real quick. Again, I'll clear out B. So if I have a list A, B, C, I can write my own rule in place. Uh, and you do that with slash dot as the shortcut, like the old website that I don't think anybody really cares about anymore. Um, and what you can do is you can write a replacement rule. So I can say B goes to, which I do with a little arrow, a little dash greater than b goes to 4. And so in here, I have not redefined b or anything. b is still just an undefined thing called b. But I took this list and I replaced any instance of b with 4. And the same thing would happen if I put two b's in here. And so I can go from uh, b to an integer. I can take b to go to, you know, some other quantity like i squared. That's fine. Um, I can then take this and I could replace yeah. Yeah, please. pi squared with 5 or something like that. So you can write your own replacement rules in place, which can be useful. Page, please meet. Okay, and then one more thing about functions. So uh, you saw that I defined f earlier. Is this how you do it? Query f. So this is going to be sine of cosine of whatever the so f of. And again, I didn't specify it had to be an integer or anything. So if I type f of cat, I'll get sine of cosine of cat. And um, if I go back up, I get this cat picture, literally. Um, I can also do f of this actual cat picture, which took the 
uh, cosine of all the brightness values and the <laughs> sine of all those brightness <laughs> Wait, uh, Ben, how did you summon the cat picture to down here? Oh, uh, I just scrolled up and I copy pasted it. So these are all just objects. Like I can manipulate these any way I want. Uh, in place, I can copy and paste them. Um, you know, whatever. Hell, I mean, you see this graphics object here, the tree form? I can take that and I can put that in the F2. Which is fine. Which, uh, this is actually a graphics object, not an image, so it doesn't take the, uh, it doesn't take the, you know, sine and cosine and brightness values, which is something that I think you run into a lot when you're newer, is, uh, you put in some sort of weird input and you get the same thing back and it just doesn't evaluate. And usually what that means is that it just doesn't know how to evaluate that because it doesn't have any sense of like, well, what am I supposed to do here? Cosine, I know what a cosine is, but how do I take the cosine, you know, graphics object, not an image? Um, there's nothing built in about the replacement rules for that, so it just doesn't do anything. Um, however, if I wanted to, I could say rasterize. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't remember how to use rasterize apparently, but there you go. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, you can do whatever you want with this. Again, it's just uh, now it's an image output. So that all just works. Um, one quick thing about functions that I want to note is, um, say again, if I have f of uh, 5.0, that's how you would normally put in a function, right? Uh, a lot of times it's handy in Mathematica and in physics, which is why we have operator notation, um, for your function to act on something. So I can also type f at 5.0, and that's going to give me the same thing. So internally that's representing the same thing as this. Um, and then lastly, you can also do postfix things like 5.0 slash slash f. This is equivalent. So. You'll use that less, but you could imagine having a list, say, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you'd be like, wait, I want to know the mean of that list, but you're very lazy and you don't want to go back to the front. So you can type slash slash mean and get the mean. Um, so it's just kind of uh, enabling you to be lazy about your function placement based on the kind of thought process you're having at the moment, which is something uh, that happens a lot in the the, the point is to let you kind of work in an idea flow, which is a really corny thing to say, but the idea is you just sit there and you just try stuff out. You know, It's very easy to experiment with whatever your thought process might be. So I brought up the list here, and I also did above. So let me talk briefly about lists. Um, so if you're familiar with arrays and other language physics, you know, vectors and matrices and tensors. Um, a list is just like the most general possible version of that, and it's represented with braces. So you can have an easy list like one, two, three, where it's three integers. Okay? You could have a list where it's an integer, a real number, uh, and a symbol. That's okay. So you can mix your types and lists, and that's okay. Um, it doesn't convert them all to reals, it doesn't round them all to integers, it's weird with the pi, it just keeps everything as it is. Um, and again, you know, I can go back up to the cat, and we can have a list that's just uh, 1, 2.0, cat, hello. So I have an integer, a real, a string, a variable, uh, uh, a complex number, and a picture of a cat, and that's okay. It's just a list. So Mathematica kind of doesn't stop you from uh, doing these sorts of dumb things, uh, which can be troublesome sometimes, but usually it's because um, it kind of opens up the space of the things that are possible for you to do. So... That information, you pulled up, is it, or is it uh, Which information? Uh, the... Uh, the heads, yes. Um, so if I typed this and I copied out, you know, if I made this my uh, list example, I did this. Can't type. 
Oh, right, I typed in this example. So the head of the list is just going to be list, but you can go into the list. Um, I'll just talk about indexing real quick. So you can index things with double brackets. So the first one is going to be an integer. The second one is going to be a real. The third one is a string. The fourth one is a symbol because it's not defined as anything. Uh, the fifth one will give us a complex number. And then the sixth one will give us an image. And of course, there's a better way to extract all those than typing one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to talk about that. I just touched your head. Do you need to type? Do you need to type? Yes, it is a kind of generalization of the data type because it works for anything inside the system, not just like types of numbers. So, yeah, but it's 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 the total analog of type. That's all it is. Um, let's see. So. That's a 1D list that has all sorts of different things, um, which is cute, but you, know, you don't often wind up with stuff like that. So let me use a built-in function to make a multi-dimensional uh, multi list. So let me make a, get a random integer between 1 and 5, and I want to make it a 5 by 5 list. So as you see here, um, if you have what you can think of as a rank 2 list, all that is, is it's a list of lists. You can kind of see this in a nice form uh, by doing matrix. So a list of lists can be represented like that. Of course, there's um, nothing to stop you from making a 5 by 5 by 5, which you can't really represent nicely uh, with a matrix form. You know, it's a <laughs> very silly looking uh, but you can do it. Um, and you can do any kind of arbitrary dimensional thing. Lists are not limited to being one, you know, rank one or rank two or rank three or whatever. They can be, oh, that, that blows up pretty quick. <laughs> so this is uh, saving me from seeing the whole output, but I could say, see the level two version of it or something, which is also a mess. But the point is you can have any dimension of list. Um, uh, another point that I think is useful to bring up is that your lists don't have to be the same size. So I could make, say, a table uh, of a random real between one and five, or a random integer, we do, between one and five, and I want this to be um, i by i, where i is just going to be some iterator. I define that somewhere. I should have cleared my kernel before this, but that was stuff. So what I can do here is I can make a table. Um, and I'm going to go from 2 to uh, 6. So here you can see I have the first result. The, ov the overall thing is a big list. The first result is a 2 by 2 list and then it's a 3 by 3 list. Let me just make a, do a column. So a two by two list, you know, I can even just do matrix form at to make it clear. So this entire thing overall is still just one list, five different lists. I mean, it is, but they're all in one list. So the point is you can have ragged lists or ragged arrays. So um, lists can have any type of content inside them, any inside them. And say the first element of the list can have 10 entries, and the second can have two, and the third can have eight. So there's no restriction on uh, the length of the sublists, which, and that's true at all levels. So, you know, you could have 10 lists that are all uh, length 10, and then the sub, uh, the sub lists of those 10 lists could have different lengths as well. So it can be ragged at any level. You can have different heads at any level. Um, so that can be useful sometimes because sometimes you might want to have a um, that's like uh, you know cat uh, two three and dog you know one two or whatever they can all have different uh, different likes and types it's all fine so I kind of uh, uh, what is it? Alluded. Hi, baby. My cat is here. She is woken up from her nap. Um, 
So I can make, let's say, a, I'm going to call it R55 for a random integer um, between 1 and 5. 5 by 5 list, not L. Uh, R55, if I want to look at that as a matrix, looks like that. And then the way you index in Mathematica, I can have 4 uh, equals 1. I less than 10, uh, oh, I plus, plus, whatever the hell, you know, and then do some sort of like sign of R10, I, or whatever it is, and, you know, you do this whole song and dance, and it's unesthetic and displeasing, it's not nice. Um, so in Mathematica, the way you do this is you don't use loops, you pretty much never use loops, you use mapping, which... Some of you are probably familiar with, but that's kind of the default of operation when working with lists in Mathematica. So if I wanted to take the sign of all of these numbers, um, what I would do is I can just say map sign onto R10. And then I don't worry about the list because, you know, to me, it's immaterial that the list has 10 entries. Like, I don't, I don't give a shit. It's, it's a list, and the, the, the point is I want to map some operation onto the elements of the list. I don't care how many there are. I don't care about, you know, a dummy variable that I need to iterate or a limit I need to set. The point is I want to map an operation onto the list, and so you just map it onto the list. Yes, it, it can. Um, so Tony has brought up a good point here. Um, it's a little messy, but um, a lot of functions don't have, like mathematically speaking, um, either a well-defined or a fully agreed upon convention for what it means to take like And the fifth column, I can, okay, that's also two. Um, it's fine. There we go. Um, and that works, you know, if you have a three-dimensional or a rank three list, you would just put more and more and more and more. So, you know, if you're in there and you're doing some horrific uh, relativity garbage, that's all fine. Um, so indexing works like that. Um, but I think something that's really useful to know about mathematics is in other languages. Um, if you want to operate on all the elements, say I have this list here, um, I'll just call this R10. If I have this and I want to operate on it, um, a lot of times you might think, okay, well, I'm, you know, for equals uh, one, I less than 10, uh, oh, I plus, plus, whatever the hell, you know, and then do some sort of like sign of R10. I or whatever it is, and, you know, you do this whole song and dance, and it's unesthetic and displeasing. It's not nice. Um, so in Mathematica, the way you do this is you don't use loops. You pretty much never use loops. You use mapping, which some of you are probably familiar with, but that's kind of the default of operation when working with lists in Mathematica. So if I wanted to take the sign of all of these numbers, um, what I would do is I can just say map sign onto R10. And then I don't worry about the list because, you know, to me, it's immaterial that the list has 10 entries. Like, I don't, I don't give a shit. It's, it's a list, and the, the, the point is I want to map some operation onto the elements of the list. I don't care how many there are. I don't care about, you know, a dummy variable that I need to iterate or a limit I need to set. The point is I want to map an operation onto the list. And so... You just map it onto the list. Can't, um, can't uh, sign already just take in a list of Yes, it, it can. Um, so Tony has brought up a good point here. Um, it's a little messy, but um, a lot of functions don't have, like mathematically speaking, um, either a well-defined or a fully agreed upon convention for what it means to take like the sign of a vector or something like that. So some functions uh, have an attribute that's called listable, and all that means is they can be applied directly to a list. So if I did try sine of R10, that does work out that way. Um, what that kind of is internally doing is this, uh, 
that I did here with the map. But some functions do uh, automatically work over lists. Um, this can be useful when you're actually, you know, using Mathematica and more used to it. Um, if you're learning it, I would stick with maps and then I would explore what things, you know, have the attribute listable um, and go from there. I mean, the same thing is true, for example. You can square everything in the list as well. <clears throat> so mapping is, uh, is the way to go for operating on lists. And if I go back to this example here, R55, if I were to say map sign onto R55, oh, that's going to be a bad example. <laughs> Let me just map a general function F. I'm going to clear F. Uh, let me map F onto R55. So here you see it maps to the first level that I talked about. So R55, 1, for example, is that. And then if I map onto that, it maps onto this level, then the next one, the next one. So if you want to map on the second level instead of on the first level, you can specify what's called a depth in your, in your map operation. And you just do that like that. So I want to operate on the second level. Um, so again, if I look at R55, just like this, it's like this. So there are two levels. There's the overall level uh, where I've got these five lists, the first level. And then there's the second level deeper where each one has these five elements in each one. So if I operate just on this one, unsurprisingly, perhaps I will get that or represented in matrix form. I will get that. So F gets applied to each of the uh, elements within there at level two is the point. So um, something that is also very useful is, uh, you know, I talked about this before, but if I have some function F, I want to apply it to a number, I can do it with an at sign. Now, if I want to do it to a list, that would just take the whole list. But what if I want to distribute F? That's what this map is for, right? Uh, there's a shorthand for map that is very useful. Um, that's what you wind up using most of the time, just because typing map and then the phone and the comma and all the brackets, you know, it takes an extra second and I'm all about shaving the seconds off on like calculations because it's just nicer this way. So if you type slash at, uh, that's the shorthand for mapping. So I have an upper fit onto each of these elements in the list. So if I run this, some that whatever function, um, you know, uh, I guess I won't do that yet, but whatever function all works. If I made that a real number, for example, again, this head thing carries. So if cosine encounters a real number uh, versus some sort of exact thing, it will just give you a real number back. Uh, again, it's arbitrary precision, but uh, you know, it has some default. And then if it sees an integer, it'll an exact value back. So you can use slash add to kind of work uh, to work a little bit more quickly with maps. Now, a lot of times, especially if you're doing research-related uh, data analysis or processing of any kind, um, your function isn't going to be, you know, cosine or, you know, multiply by five or something. It's going to be something more complicated. So, you know, I don't have to uh, come up with something realistic necessarily, but I could do sine of cosine of tangent of some mix of things. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have some function I want to apply uh, to my list. And what I can do is I can represent the input uh, with a hashtag or an octothorpe or a slot, uh, whatever you want to call it. And that will just take the place of my variable here. So I'm not defining any function. I'm just writing one in place. So I want to take the sine of the cosine of the tangent of two times the input plus one. Uh, and 
then once I'm done writing my function using slot here as a placeholder for my variable, I can type an ampersand and that will close it off. So you see uh, it goes from pink, which is kind of unmatched, to teal, which tells you that the function's been written. Uh, now I can write it 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I get that mapped to all of them. So this is called a pure function in Mathematica. Um, in Python or other languages, you might know it as a lambda function, um, which is, you know, which you might have also seen back in what, God, I don't even remember, one of your early calculus classes in undergrad, um, where you do optimization. Um, same, same idea. So you can just write any function you want. Um, and it doesn't have to be mathematical necessarily, can or whatever it might be. So, for example, um, if I wanted to do um, edge detect on an image, um, what I could do, um, edge detect on, let's say, an image where I've by two. I could map that onto a list of images. And let me get uh, some images from Standard thing to do here, and I'm just pasting these in from a uh, Google image search in another window. Wait, Ben, these yeah. aren't, aren't all just pictures of your cat? They are not, um, although you know, <laughs> get one for for posterity's sake. I think I have a nice uh, keyboard shortcut for screenshotting into clip. Um, and then one of baby. And then I can do edge detect on all of these things divided by two, which is, you know. Baby. Yeah, there's there's baby in the edge there. It's a little messed up. Um, so we can do edge detection at different levels. So that's pure functions. Um, the point is there, I kind of explained that a little poorly, but the point is if you just want to write the function in place real quick, um, you can do that and then you can map it across your list uh, at whatever level. So if you don't want to go and say, oh, you know, equal to uh, edge detect image over to uh, at the level five of pixel, you know, thickness, whatever, you can just write it in place. Uh, this doesn't get saved anywhere. It's just an in-place definition of some function that you can use, and you can use it however you want. Um, it's not just for mapping. It would work just like a regular function if you fed it, for example, one image. You just fed it this image of baby, and that works just the same. Um, and maybe I want to say colorize, whatever it is, which is not very interesting because it's just that. But you can make it as complicated or as simple. Um, so, you know, some horrific thing like this. Um, you have a lot of options in terms of what you do. So you can write any arbitrary function whatsoever, slot here, and that will take the place of your variable. And then once you've finished writing your function, you close it off with an ampersand, and then it works just like any other function. Um, so that's kind of how you deal with things at a typical level. So what does the ampersand do? So the ampersand tells it that you're done writing your... So this is actually kind of subtly hinted at by the color coding, but that's only something you notice after you are. 
I think. So watch what happens if I type um, g of x colon equals, um, and then I say I want it to be sine of x plus 1. Um, I'm going to make this larger so you can see the color better. You see that teal color? So that teal color corresponds to a variable inside of uh, a function in mathematics. Now, if I go in here and I start typing um, sine of slot plus 1, I'm going to make this large too. Again, so you can see the color. Right now it's pink. Or I looked up the color of this once, but it doesn't have, uh, it's not teal, so it's not. Close this function with an ampersand. It changes it to that teal color, which is supposed to be kind of a hint that it's working like a variable here. Um, I have a quick question. Sorry, how do you yes. expand? How do you make the, the text larger? Oh, uh, same way you do it in Chrome or whatever. If you just control minus and control plus. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think you can also like set that as a default if you want, but um, that can be a little messy depending on what you're. Doing. But in general, this sort of stuff will just work. Um, it's still, you know, it's still an expression in the same way it was. Before. So you can set that to whatever size. So that's kind of how you work with stuff at a low level. Um, just are there any questions about kind of this rambling I've done so far? I'm learning a lot. OK, I'm glad. So yes. Uh, at one point earlier in the semester, I started a Mathematica project and quickly gave up on it because I, I got mm -hmm. too overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But um, potentially, you might be able to walk me through sort of how I would do, do it. Yeah. Uh, the, the goal was to kind of create a sound out of an mm -hmm. and specifically a person's face. So you, oh, yeah. you, take, you take a photo of the profile of them, you convert the profile of their face into a function, and then and your Fourier transforms will get the, the frequency that it makes. Right. Um, so. There are a couple of ways to go about that. I think there is an automatic way to do it. Um, but, all oh right, that is the automatic way. Um, check this out. Let me go ahead and take that baby picture, uh, as it were. Let me just get a binarized version of that real quick. Binarized. Not very interesting. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it as is, honestly, without the binarization. And there's a built-in function called inverse spectrogram, which uh, does precisely what you have said. So there is the uh, Fourier components of this. And now what I do is it in the front. Oh, that's not nearly as, as pretty as I hope. Yeah, that's uh, that's what happened. So one one other cool thing I'd like to kind of demonstrate on that on that note, but that is how you do it, and uh, you can, of course, uh, we can we can talk about specifics later because you know it's going to be a little bit more involved. But there's it's kind of the automatic way to do it. But if I were to go to my downloads, I probably have an MP3 in here of some kind. Oh wow! What a coincidence! Oh no! I just want to oh my god! <laughs> Who knows that one? I, uh, <laughs> I just so let's say I have. That, uh, I I got this MP3 file here, and I just dragged it in. Just that's allowed. So here it is. I can press play. Little hymn of the Soviet Union there. Um, and what I can do is I can just directly type a uh, spectrogram on that. Tick tock, tick tock. And you get a spectrogram. Um, so inverse spectrogram is just doing the opposite thing. It is considering uh, this image here, or any image you give it, to be um, a spectrogram. And then it is converting that back into an audio object. Um, so you can do a lot of dumb things, like you can add two audio things together, literally just like if you have one, you can type one plus the other, um, and you can overlay them like that. 
So what I did was I got an inverse, uh, an inverse picture of a certain Soviet ruler, and I encoded that into the like 14k to 18k region uh, of a spectrogram, and then I just added the two together, and I made a version of the uh, of this song where if you look at the spectrogram, it has a picture up here, but you can't really hear it. It's just kind of a very high pitched drone. Um, but you can encode things in sounds like that. It's, it's very trivial to do. Um, so the, the inverse is indeed pretty trivial to do, Charles. And like I said, we can talk about that a bit uh, later if you want you know, a more bespoke solution than just using a spectrogram. Because yeah, uh, when you just convert things like that to sound, it's very ugly. I think um, the way that you did it, I believe, converted every pixel into um, sound. I was going to try to go for the waveform that the that the outline of the face, which I hope would be make slightly more sense, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it would make slightly more sense. Uh, you would so because it takes this whole image as a um, that's covering the whole frequency range by default. So what you would want to do. Um, is there are kind of two ways to do it. You can get your uh, face or outline and you can pad it on top with blank space so that it gets converted down and say it occupies the more audible region instead of being like a hissy mess. Um, or when you convert the data, you can just scale the frequencies back down. Again, we can, we can talk about that. Um, so I want to cover just very briefly some standard math things that probably most of you know. Um, so you can take the derivative using D, uh, one of the few kind of abbreviations and functions in Mathematica. But you can do this for any horrible, awful, um, uh, to the E minus 1. Um, uh, divided by x to the eighth, um, let's say, log of x to the eighth plus pi, you know, some awful thing. Whatever it is, you can get a derivative. Uh, it's done. Um, that always just works. Uh, using this replacement rule business, I suppose, um, I can say, okay, that's the derivative analytically of this. What happens when x is 0.2? And there's my, you know, function. <laughs> um, so you can, this, this, I don't guarantee that this is going to work. This could well just absolutely uh, break, but let me see if it's a plottable thing. So if I can take the real part of this um, and plot it, this x goes from, say, minus 1 to 1. Not very nice, but hey, it works. Uh, plot range. All plot points. You can add more plot points if you're noticing that the interpolation is bad. Well, <laughs> that's about what you would expect, I guess. It's a mess. And we can go from minus 0.25 to something like that. Also a mess. Sure, whatever. The point is, you can do it. Um, you can, of course, do, you know, um, whatever integrals you're interested in analytically um, like that. Or if you have, because again, it's a term rewriting system, so it knows, okay, I know the integral of sine and cosine or whatever. And you can also, of course, uh, do this oh, I went to the top. Uh, from, you know, minus pi, or from pi to pi uh, to pi over or something, which I guess is negative there. Yeah, so you can get again uh, analytic answers for these. Know what all of these values are, so it's not going to give you, you know, uh, it's not going to give you this like programs might. Um, so you can do all sorts of uh, calculus stuff, it's linear algebra, whatever the hell. Um, a very you know useful thing, of course, as I said before, is you can do uh, plots, which I'm sure you guys all know. You can do plot 3D, 
uh, sine of, uh, say, x, y, put a asterisk there, x goes from minus pi to pi, y goes from minus pi to pi, and there's your function, it's beautiful, it's automatically lit, you know, automatically scaled and everything, not quite pretty enough, you can add more plot points, um, and now you see it's uh, rendered with more care, um, you can, you know, turn off the um, you can turn it off like uh, the boxes. Um, um, and for example, sign has a minimum. So we can add filling down to say two. And we get this, which doesn't look very interesting. But what we can do is we can just pick this up in place. Let's see if this works right now. But let's export this uh, sign test thing dot stl. Paste that. Try exporting it. Okay. For some reason, this is broken. It ought not be broken, but it is. But in general, if you have some sort of, um, I'm going to yell at somebody about this. Uh, in general, if you have some sort of, um, you can output a, uh, or if you have some sort of surface, if you use filling, what you can do is you can export um, an STL of it. That goes for kind of graphs and for you know, graphics objects. So if you had, eh, that's enough of that. Um, one last thing, this has gone long. Take all questions for however long, honestly. Um, one last thing I wanted to get in was uh, manipulate, which lets you manipulate any number of parameters in any object. So for example, I can type manipulate uh, two to the n. And I'll pretty print it. And n will go from, say, uh, 0 to 10 in steps of 1. And so I can just do that. So that's fine. That, that's nice. I can do a random real or a random integer again uh, between 1 and 10. And I can ask for n of them. Um, so 0, 1, 2 and so on. Um, I can ask for n by n of them. And this thing can be in matrix form because it will take any input whatsoever. So I can do that. And of course, uh, this works with graphics object. Well, so if, you know, if you're a babby, you don't know how uh, wave numbers or say phases work, um, what you can do is you can manipulate the wave number from say point to 10 continuously, because I said starting point and ending point, they didn't be continuous. And then I can manipulate uh, the phase from zero to two pi. So then I have a manipulatable object like this. And I can in real time move this around. I can change the phase and so on. Um, I can also give it like a sign in the front, which I'll do S, and then I can say um, S will vary between only two things, just minus one and one, please. And then I get a little button that will flip it. So this works. Uh, this works in 3D, of course. Um, sine k x y. So we got our little surface there. If I change the phase, you can see it ripple, re-render. Uh, once I let go of the slider, flip it, and I can, of course, 
make a mess by changing the uh, wave number. It looks better if I do uh, minus pi to pi, but you get the point. So any sort of object here, uh, you can do that with. And again, this is this is useful for a lot of different things. So if I wanted to take uh, this image of baby again, I can do this with images. Um, manipulate edge detect uh, at a level. Oops, I forgot my bracket at a level e, and then I can manipulate. E to go from say 1 to 20. So this way you can find parameters that are good for whatever uh, all at once instead of uh, just kind of typing in a bunch of stuff and trying it out until you get something you like. You can just automate that process. Or for example, um, I could do uh, image heat points which is a function that will try and find important points in an image by some metric. It knows a lot of different algorithms and specify which one you want if you have a favorite from like a previous project, but uh, key point strength um, S and then S can go from say point over one to point one. And what this will do is don't worry about this. So here it thinks, you know, these little pink points are uh, areas of interest. And then maybe I think, okay, that's too many. I need things that are more specified. So what I can do is I can change the key point strength indicator in real time. Okay. I want, here it's too big of a range, so let me say. 0.01. So clearly, like this would be too many in some project. You can say, okay, what do I want? Maybe that's about the right strength. And then you can just click here and you can see whatever value that is, and then you can carry on. Um, so this is really handy for basically anything. Um, if you had some. Um, this is the last thing I'll do, and then I am open for a trillion questions. Um, if I had uh, a table of sine of, say, x plus oops, a random real between minus 0.1 and 0.1, uh, as x goes from, say, 0 to um, 2 pi and steps of 0.05, I'm going to call this noisy sign. So that's, you know, just some noisy thing. I'm going to make it higher density. And if I do a, a plot of this, it's a plot of a list, so I will use list plot. Uh, it looks like that. Uh, and maybe I want to filter that. Maybe that's noise that I have, right? Um, so what I could do is I could manipulate the list plot uh, by using a uh, Gaussian filter, for example. And what level do I want? Uh, let me filter it on a level. And then I can do this. So now I can just see this. And then I say, OK, that's the number I want. Or maybe you know this is more. Um, you can use a Gaussian filter, a low pass, a high pass, any sort of filter, um, any sort of thing, um, any number of parameters, any of that. Uh, and it will all just work inside Manipulate automatically. Um, so Manipulate is very, very handy uh, for basically any task you might be interested in. Um, so with that, I've taken too much time to talk about the things I want. So feel free to go if you have to. Um, if you have any questions about how you might accomplish a certain task or you know, any questions about anything I did, feel free to ask, you know, also always feel free to DM me about mathematica related things. Uh, that's, that's about it. Thanks, Ben. You're welcome, Sam. Thank you, Ben. Oh, God, what was that? Uh, it wasn't me, was it? Uh, I, don't think I, think, so. I think someone's mic came on for a moment. It was the Fourier transform of somebody's bed.
Oh, Jess, Jess your connection. <laughs> you you brought this up. Jess, your mic makes you sound like a, a droid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Star Wars. I need you to Roger, Roger. <laughs> I think. Yeah. All right. Well. Oh wait, wait, wait. Where, where, where would people be able to DM you? Would you prefer Facebook or Discord or what? Um, I guess I can stay in this Discord. You can DM me or make post in. Let's see. I post in a chat here. Then. The excellent adventures will be good. Ah, uh, yes. Let me scroll up or down. There's so many channels, which is good, but confuse me. <laughs> Reach me at. Uh, I'm just gonna put my personal email. But um, you can always reach me there. If, uh, under my alternate name, feel free to reach me there. Or anywhere else, really. I, we're all on thirty different platforms, so. Yeah. Um, Abel, how did the recording go? Did it work out well? Abel is muted. Does Abel know he's muted? Abel, yeah, it's going well. I'm still recording. Okay, perfect. Cool. Thanks. All right. Well, Ben, I'm gonna head out. It was nice to see you. Again, I'll talk to you again later. Bye, guys. You too. See you, Charles. And so, again, if you have any, you know, research questions about how to do something, I know Tony has messaged me a few times. Uh, but you know, always feel free to. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do that is fair to do. Not the language so. Yeah, this, this is, like, really low-level, like, just little, like, uh, random character, like, ampersand and hashtag simple stuff. It always really confused me. Uh, yeah, kind of. yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I learned that. I actually don't remember when I learned it, but I remember being very confused uh, when my grad TA for kind of the equivalent of advanced lab uh, was doing that to help me analyze some data. And I was like, "What the fuck? What, what is all this?" Because you can, you know, you can write all sorts of absurd, you know, crazy nonsense. Uh, I mean, I've written some crazy stuff myself, but. Once you kind of, once you have a sense of work, um, it's not so bad. It's something you might be interested in, for example, um, say I have the list one, two, three, four, five. We talked earlier about how the head of that is list, right? Right. Um, there's a shortcut for something called apply, and what that does is it replaces the head with a different head of your choosing. So f at at this will just be that. So you can do things like times. Um, wait, so, okay, uh, <laughs> oh wait, no, I really don't, okay, so I understand what it does operationally, but I don't understand the at -at. So, uh, that's just a shorthand for a function that's called apply, and apply simply replaces the head of whatever the argument is with whatever this thing is. Um, oh, so it's like... Okay, so it does like. Okay, so basically, it says instead of it, instead of making this list by Mathematica demands that it is the sum of all those things or the multiplication of all those things. Exactly. So like here, if you look at this from the tree form, right, which is another way of looking. I think it's a nicer way, typically, of looking at the input form. Oh, no, that really should be list full form. That's what it is. So. What apply does is it looks up level here at the head of the tree, and then it just swaps this out for whatever thing you want. So, you know, if I replace this with times, that's the same thing as using apply uh, times here, or times um, at, at, at. So this can be kind of subtly useful in some ways, but is that you, Sam? Sorry. <laughs> I knew it was you. Is there like a list of like applicable formulas? Is there not formulas, but a... Shorthands? Or like yes. things that 
that uh, like like times and lists where their heads. Uh, I'm not asking this very well. Like, it's okay. Uh, it's a meta concept here. Is it? Is there? Is so like using the apply function mm -hmm. uh, list with times or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a list of things that fit under the category of times that can also that can be used in that in the apply function? No, it's uh, it's one hundred percent general. So any function, period. Um, literally any function. Wow. Yeah. So of course that means a lot of times you're going to make any sense, but um, sine of you know e to the uh, five or e to the thing. I can close it off to the ampersand, and I can apply that to one, two, three, four, five. That's going to complain because exponential doesn't know how to take those things. Or, Mm, interesting. <laughs> mm. It's interesting. Mm. <sighs> That's so useful. That seems to tell me he. That's what I would expect us to get the error. Don't know. Well, doesn't that need to be in brackets, or doesn't need to be in brackets? It's in, uh... That's the thing, because the, the brackets are a shorthand. So I'm stripping the list and replacing it with this. Okay. Okay, I see. So actually, I don't I don't know why that uh, why that works. It's a little confusing to me. But in general, um, you can you can do that sort of sort of thing. Um, there's there's a lot of like little shorthands like that. Um, Thanks, Ben. Yes, you're welcome. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. 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 There's totally a list of all these shorthands somewhere. Where did it go? Um, I'm just going to post it in chat. Um, there's, uh, there's also another kind of amusing thing. Bring up, most people just look and go like, what the fuck? Um, there's an infix operator where if you have a function of two variables, um, you can also write that like this. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> what? so it seems silly, right? Well, let's say you're thinking, and you're like, I want to plot sine of kx with varying k. Um, uh, then you'd be like, oh, okay, let me just manipulate that. k goes from 0.1 to 1. And that works. There are a lot of silly things you can do like that. Um, and you probably already know, I mentioned it before we came in, because I think Sam asked, but, you know, if you want to input any spec press escape, and if you type the, uh, just one letter or the capital version, you'll get the, um, you know, Greek version, typically. And if you do a capital, you know, that works. You can do script A, you know, script B, uh, Euler E, imaginary I, you know, um, Whatever it is, you can do all that stuff pretty easy. But yeah, that's uh, that's about it, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. But uh, yeah, have a good night.